As human beings, we are born with a desire to prosper. To learn and grow. To make things better for all of us. We wish to be free to chart our own course. To build our own future. To live our lives the way we choose. To worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. To speak our mind. To live our lives without fear. Of being killed. Of being kidnapped. Or of being robbed. We want freedom. I want freedom that is not available in my country. Freedoms that have been lost to our planet since before I was born. I don't want to have to pick from existing countries where I will have to trade some freedoms for other freedoms. I don't want to pay taxes, fees that I never consented to. I want all of my basic human rights, all of my freedoms. I want to own and control my life, my freedom, and my property. This is Freedom Haven. So, how exactly do we do that? It's well and good to talk about wanting freedom. I mean, who doesn't want more freedom? But how do you get these freedoms peacefully in a world where no single country offers all of the freedoms we see, regardless of who we vote for? The answer is in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which pretty much every seafaring country on Earth has either signed or promised to uphold. Previous to this agreement, many countries didn't agree on where their jurisdiction ended and someone else's began, which was problematic especially in contested waters. One result of this agreement is that the countries agree that their jurisdictions end 200 nautical miles from shore, outside of what is called the Exclusive Economic Zone. While the details are a little bit more complicated, this essentially means that as long as we remain more than 200 nautical miles from any nation, we are legally outside of their jurisdiction, and we are free to establish our own laws, as long as we are flying a flag of convenience that groups like the International Maritime Organization recognizes as legitimate. This leaves almost half of the Earth available for us to use. Here we could have freedom heaven, and you could essentially do whatever you wanted as long as you didn't threaten the life, freedom, or property of other people. Here we would have the highest economic freedom and social freedom available anywhere on the planet. While on this subject, it's worth noting that the phrase international waters is not formally defined in international law, which has led to a lot of confusion on this subject. Some people define it as everything outside of the territorial waters, 12 nautical miles from shore, while others define it as everything outside of the exclusive economic zone, 200 nautical miles from shore. But since real freedom isn't found until you're outside of the exclusive economic zone, the phrase international waters is mostly useless and should be avoided. Also, under the phrase international waters, many people have been led to incorrectly think countries have been violating the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea whenever they seize or attack flag vessels that are said to have been in international waters, but which were actually within the exclusive economic zone making those vessels within that country's legal jurisdiction. For this reason, international waters is not the correct phrase to use when talking about freedom. Instead, use the phrase outside of the exclusive economic zone. Having a canoe on a river, or a houseboat on a calm lake, or even a sailboat in a sheltered harbor is one thing. How could we create a permanent home on the unforgiving high seas? Human beings have been on the high seas at least since the Vikings and Christopher Columbus. In modern times mankind has built massive floating cities where people live in cabins and work or play on the ship for days, weeks, months, or years. We've even built large yachts where the wealthy can live in luxury, all while living on the high seas. We have the technology. Let's cover some recent modern day examples. First on the list is the $17.5 billion nuclear-powered USS Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier, which can remain on the high seas as long as needed. It's 333 meters long, has 25 decks, or floors, and can house a maximum population of 4,539 people. Ignoring support costs, that's almost $4 million per person. Next on the list is the $1.35 billion Symphony of the Seas cruise ship which travels the high seas between exotic destinations. It's 361 meters long, has 18 decks, and can house a maximum population of 8,880 people. Ignoring support costs, 
that's $152,000 per person. Next we have the 160 to 180 million dollar HMM Al Jazeera's container ship, which travels through the high seas transporting its cargo of up to 23,820 20 foot equivalent containers, which is about 80 acres of space for cargo between ports. It's 400 meters long, has 20 decks, and a population of 20 to 25 people. Ignoring support costs, that's between $6.4 and $9 million per person. But what makes this ship of particular interest is the fact that it has 80 acres of cargo space. Imagine if cabins, offices, stores, and other services and businesses were built in that space instead. In addition, all platform spars can also remain on the high seas and range from $2 million to $3 billion to construct and can house 10 to 200 people. Ignoring support costs, that's between 0.2 to $15 million per person. But in theory the cost of spars could be brought down to only $125,000 per person. While spars can make for some visually appealing designs, it's worth noting that they can't carry as much weight since they displace less water compared to the other monohull vessels previously mentioned. These ships and platforms have been optimized for their respective target industries and reveal to us that high seas living space costs ranges from $400 to $10,000 per square foot or around $4,000 to $100,000 per square meter. For the sake of affordability, most people at Freedom Haven would probably be interested in the lower end of that range, with new technologies constantly being explored to try to bring that price even lower. But this is why people, who live in houses on land, usually live in shared cabins on the seas. For the freedoms available outside the exclusive economic zone, we would be willing to make that move to a new home on the sea. Lastly on the list, we have the new Liberty structure we've been designing to be the initial vessel to start off Freedom Haven. It is estimated at around $260 million, is 172 meters long, has a safe harbor and gantry crane for imports and exports, has 17 decks with 4,000 cabins that can be combined or built for other industrial, medical, or other custom purposes. To facilitate imports and exports, there are two special cargo holds with a max shipping container capacity of 323 40-foot shipping containers, the resulting population would be estimated at around 5,000 to 10,000 people and would have a population density similar to a typical cruise ship. As the population and space needs grow, this city would be expanded with additional structures that could connect together. The resulting estimated cost is around $65,000 per cabin, or TEU, which is $444 per square foot or $4,784 per square meter. This cost includes 10 years of ship maintenance, security, and septic systems. Ignoring the cost of living, and depending greatly on just how much space a person chooses to live in, that's between $5,000 and $125,000 per person, making it one of the cheapest options for high seas living available today. The vessel would be built at the most cost-effective mega shipyards that are currently being used today, such as Samsung Heavy Industries in South Korea, which designs and produces similar mega ships about once per month. As a bustling medical, housing, business and industrial city complex on the ocean with a thriving free market, we'll have all of the medical services that the market has a need for. And as a result of a free market, the cost of medical care, hospitals, doctors, medical equipment, medicine, etc., will be drastically lower and higher quality than on the mainland. Any product or service that the people are willing to pay for, competing entrepreneurs will work to provide, and the results will show just what free individuals are capable of accomplishing once their chains have been removed. This is Freedom Haven. So, where do we put it? With almost half of the Earth being outside the exclusive economic zone, we have a good selection of locations Freedom Haven can choose from. Here are some factors we consider when looking at locations. Shallow sea mounts. Islands are mountains in the ocean that reach from the deep seabed up to above the waterline. But there are many ocean mountains that don't reach the water surface. 
These seamounts can sometimes come high enough to build structures on them, or anchor ships to them, even though they aren't technically islands. Ocean gyres and current doldrums. White sections of the map show places with the lowest average annual ocean current speeds. NOAA's current animations give a better understanding on how these change throughout the year. Spots with a slow enough current won't need any anchoring, and only minor engine corrections. Average Wave Height Some areas of the ocean, like the North Sea, can have extreme waves. But, there are other areas of the ocean where wave heights of 5 meters have never been recorded, even during storms. While our vessel will be built to withstand the worst the ocean has to offer, we will focus on the calmest area of the ocean for the comfort of the residents. Areas on this map, shown in blue and purple, are of particular interest. Storm paths. There are areas of the world, like to the east and west of South America, where almost no storms have ever been recorded, making these and other similar areas very attractive to some. Note, this image shows the paths of the centers of the storms, not the areas affected by the storms. Average ocean temperatures. There are some sections of Antarctica that remain unclaimed by any country to this day. Why? Because it's too cold to really prosper there. Temperature is important to consider when choosing a location. Global trade routes. Modern container ships can move 24,000 20-foot containers in a single trip, and a truck can only move two per trip. This is why it's cheaper to move a banana halfway around the world than it is to move an apple to a neighboring state. Understanding this helps us to see why it's a good idea to stay close to these global trade routes. The closer we are to this shipping container traffic, the faster and cheaper our imports and exports will be. One of the locations being considered is the south end of the Bay of Bengal, a little to the west of the northern tip of the 90 East Ridge in the Indian Ocean. So, how will we pay for it? The Freedom Haven Organization does not have $260 million sitting in a bank account somewhere, and none of us are billionaires. Raising the money to build Freedom Haven will be a group effort. As each investor pays for their own 10-year lease on the space they are reserving on the completed structure, those funds will be placed into an escrow account. The total space available for lease on the new Liberty vessel is 4,000 TEUs, or 20-foot equivalent units a cabin space of around 19.5 feet long by 7 and a half feet wide by 8 feet tall. The project will be completed in four progressive phases, as each individual phase is funded and then implemented. Phase 1 was paid for, and completed, out of pocket at no cost to the other investors, and included the initial creation of the plan, design, constitution, etc. Some of the fruits of this phase can be seen in this video. Additional refinements will continue to be made as needed during the process. Phase 2 is $5 per TEU, $20,000 total. In this phase we will do additional marketing and create a 187th, H0, scale model of the new Liberty vessel which can then be brought to and demoed at various probability and seasteading events like ephemeri, interviews, investor meetings, etc. Phase 3 is $500 per TEU, $2 million total. In this phase we will do additional marketing and hire Samsung Heavy Industries naval architects, or their competitors, to make the professional detailed designs, prototype wave tank testing, etc. It's during this phase that the final cost of Phase 4 will be refined and finalized with the shipyard and related industries needed to build the Freedom Haven New Liberty vessel. Phase 4 is estimated to be around $64,500 per TEU, around $258 million total. In this phase we estimate that we will pay $165 million to Samsung Heavy Industries Shipyard, or their competitors, for the building of the new Liberty vessel, Azimuth and traditional thrusters, the Gantry Crane, the Outrigger Stormbreaker Harbor, the Spa Hotel and Apartments, and the Public Plaza. We will put $40 million into an escrow account to handle the funding of the security and maintenance of the new Liberty vessel for 10 years, $4 million per year. 
we will spend $20 million buying and converting 4,000 industrial TEU units into new Liberty-compatible modular baseline cabin spaces with septic, water, and other hookups. This comes out to $5,000 per cabin. Lease owners can adjust the provided cabin space units or bring their own and their lease costs would be adjusted as needed accordingly. We will spend $10 million to transport the new Liberty vessel to its final destination. This cost could vary a lot depending on the chosen destination. We will spend $5 million purchasing and installing five more master NXG units from Cavatec Automated Mooring System. These will aid in the docking of larger ships that don't fit in the harbor. We will spend $2 million on two strong seagoing tugboats. We will spend $1 million on ROV, remotely operated vehicle, and bathymetric equipment for maintenance and support of the new Liberty vessel. We will use around $15 million for various miscellaneous costs that are still being ironed out, such as central air heat pump air conditioners, acting as dehumidifiers, maintenance cassoons, solar panels, and the territorial waters border. While the estimated average cost will be around $65,000 per TEU lease, this will actually range from $32,500 to $130,000, with no upper limit, based on the popularity of some cabin locations in the vessel over others. $65,000 is the average TEU lease costs, with larger personal, business, or industrial spaces being created out of multiple TEU spaces. Phases 2 through 4 would add up to the total estimated project cost of $260 million. So when will Freedom Haven be built? We would all love to be able to start construction immediately, but the reality is that this will take time. On May 20, 2018, a small group of liberty-minded friends kicked off the Freedom Haven project when they created a Facebook group called Creating a Libertarian Seasteading Micronation, now called Gathering Freedom Haven, Building a Seasteading Micronation. Since then the project's numbers, popularity, and support have doubled each year. At the current rate of growth, it is believed that Phase 2 will be funded by 2026, Phase 3 will be funded by 2030, and Phase 4 would be funded by 2034, with move-in day happening sometime in 2037, at which point the 10-year leases will begin. To stave off inflation, inflation-resistant currencies, like Bitcoin, might be considered for both the store of value in the escrow accounts as well as costs estimates, although these details are still being discussed. We believe that there are enough people in the world, who have both the interest and financial ability, to fund the Freedom Haven project and make it a reality, we just need to find them. Are you one of those people? Join our cause and let's build a brighter future together. If you would like to help with the Freedom Haven project, Consider supporting our Phase 2 Patreon with a contribution of $1, $5, $25 or more. You can find more information on our website at www.freedomhaven.org. You can also find us on Facebook.